thank you very much for that very kind introduction. I appreciate it. And uh, I look forward uh, to uh, this occasion. And I had a chance, uh, thanks to Professor Akabayashi's uh, kindness, to understand much more of Fukuzawa's uh, tremendous influence on shaping uh, economic and social policy and the state of education in Japan. And so I want to start off this lecture not only with a picture, but a quotation from his important work. And it's something that I think is uh, extremely important and actually was influential in what he was doing in shaping uh, 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 Japanese uh, economic and social policy and the mission of this university. So in this lecture, in this, in this quotation, you can see that uh, uh, Fukuzawa was saying that basically the difference between the wise and the stupid, the rich and the poor, really came down to a matter of education. And he really believed, as Adam Smith did before him, that in fact we were all equal and we differed only in the kind of wisdom that we acquired in our lifetime experience. Now today I'm going to somewhat quarrel with that wisdom. I don't think it's completely true that we're all equal. I think we're born with different endowments. But I do think there's some important wisdom in this commentary, and I want to talk about it today, and what we know about how we might modify and act on this statement in social policy. So let me talk about some trends. I don't want to come to Japan and tell you about your own society. In fact, I came here to learn. But what's interesting is to kind of chart something which I think is now very much in trend, very much discussed in uh, social policy discussions in Japan, and that is the trends in family income inequality that have happened since 1985. And uh, you can see two lines in this figure. Uh, let me see, I think I can point here. Yes, here we are. So here you can see the trends before taxes and transfers and the trends after taxes and transfers. So this is basically what the market economy is throwing up which is an increase in inequality as measured by the Gini coefficient. Uh, the tax and transfer system reduces the inequality, so that's the difference between this graph and this graph here, but still there's an upward trend. And uh, as, a, as a matter of fact, if we look uh, and see the various components of inequality that are occurring in, uh, in Japan, where we see the greatest uh, incidence of poverty is really in the condition of mother-child households, single-parent households, which are still a small fraction of all Japanese households, but nonetheless are among the most impoverished. And so if we look at measures of wealth, uh, we look at poverty rates, overall relatively low, but if you look at this particular group of people, for example, this group of people identified as uh, parents uh, with uh, single children, you can see the poverty rate is high and has been increasing. So uh, we have then uh, a situation which is uh, of some great concern. And of course, when we study this in greater detail, we can see substantial differences between the full-time employed and the less than full-time employed between the men and the women. And these are major sources of inequality. But the poverty rates by household types, although not the highest in terms of any OECD country around the world is quite high and is certainly not among the lowest either. And we can see inequality among education and we can also see, and this is a point I want to come back to repeatedly in this lecture, that family income plays a very key role in determining whether students are going on to college, whether or not they go to four-year university, whether or not they succeed in a kind of uh, success that uh, many of you have and will experience, but not all Japanese can experience. Now, in recent discussions in the United States and around the world, there's been a uh, concern about the relationship between income inequality at a point in time and social mobility. Uh, there's a lot of discussion of this. Uh, Alan Kruger, who was formerly the president's uh, head of the President's Council of Economic Advisors under President Obama in the, uh, just a few years ago, left office, uh, basically gave this curve the name the Gatsby Curve in honor of a novel by uh, 
F. Scott Fitzgerald, The Great Gatsby, uh, which was a story of uh, children uh, in an era in the 1920s in the United States with substantial inequality and rising inequality, as a matter of fact, that led up to and actually preceded, and some people say even caused, or at least it certainly was associated with the Great Depression that started in the United States and around the world in 1929. Now the importance of this function and this curve, this relationship, is that we see uh, a relationship between the so-called Gini coefficient, which is moving from here to here. So you can see where Japan lies uh, in this figure. Uh, it's not among the highest among inequality, but it's certain, this is after tax and transfer, but you can also see that it's not the lowest either. But you can also see that this coefficient beta, which is sometimes called the intergenerational elasticity, which is the relationship between how the income of the parents affects the income of children in the next generation, how closely related they are. And so one measure of social mobility is exactly how much this beta, this coefficient beta, is actually departs from zero. So a perfectly flat line would say income inequality plays no role whatsoever. And uh, this is the, the beta is plotted in this line, and overall income inequality is here. So people have said, well, as you move up to a higher value of beta, there's less and less social mobility. The accident of birth plays a much stronger role in determining how people succeed or prosper in the next generation. So many people say, well, there's a relationship between family income inequality and a cross-section and this intergenerational elasticity. But that's a question that's very important in social science research. What exactly does this relationship mean? The relationship between the income of the parent and the income of the child in the next generation. What do we make of that? And I think there's a lot of, a lot of discussion and I want to talk about that discussion today. So in particular, there are two ways to interpret that graph. So if I go back to the graph and you keep it in mind, one is that the intergenerational income elasticity itself is a determinant of inequality. That essentially the importance of family income and family background is the source that generates inequality in the society. But other people turn that around and say, no, the causality goes the other way. That in fact, the income inequality is a source of why there's immobility across. And many people would say, what is exactly the causal link? So to understand how to evaluate social policy and to understand exactly how one should react to this kind of graph and the kind of evidence, we should ask ourselves, should there be policies that attempt to lower this IGE, reduce the beta, reduce the dependence of a child's outcomes on the parent's own environments and background? And if so, what form should they take? And so that's what I want to talk about today. And that's how I go back to Fukuzawa's notion about how uh, individual inequality gets shaped. So one famous paper and line of paper is a paper that was developed by my former colleague, now deceased, Gary Becker, along with a student, uh, uh, Nigel Tomes, and then popularized later by Gary Solon at Michigan State, is basically that heritability, genetics, plays a very important role. So as heritability increases, beta goes up. So that's an obvious explanation. And that's, of course, very counter to what Fukuzawa was saying. Heritability played no role whatsoever. But when he was writing, Modern genetics really had not really been established. And so you could pardon his ignorance or unwillingness to uh, talk about that because it wasn't so obvious. Uh, but there are other factors that might cause beta to go up, this intergenerational mobility coefficient. It really should be an intergenerational immobility coefficient. And that is as parents become, are more efficient and parents actually spend more time, know better how to produce successful children the next generation, beta would go up. If you have advantaged parents, your own childhood will be advantaged, and that can perpetrate inequality across generation. Another component that leads to this is inequality in wages. So if your family pays, plays a very important role in financing education and providing opportunities, then inequality in income, which is not low in Japan, but not the highest in the world by any measure, that could contribute to more intergenerational immobility. 
That's been one line of thinking that has captured many, many people uh, and many, much imagination. And yet another explanation is public provision of investment increases, then there may be more immobility in the population. So if we imagine there's inequality in provision of schooling, provision of access, uh, public goods, that that would be a source of increase in inequality. So what do we know from the literature? The literature has been revitalized. So this work of Becker and Tomes goes back some 30 years. And we've had a lot of work that's been done. And this work I want to describe and summarize, which combines work not only in economics, but work in uh, combining economics with genetics. It combines work with uh, aspects of other fields in social science and uh, in, in, in medicine as well. So we have a large body of work. And I want to try to summarize today what these bodies of work would be. So the original work, uh, say post-Fukuzawa work, would be work that actually uh, focused a lot about inequality and ability. So what came to be very prevalent as a way of view, point of view in the 1950s and 60s was the notion that IQ and ability played a very important role, and that might be genetically determined. And so with the influx of cognitive psychology and the, in the focus on trying to increase the structure of, uh, of uh, e equality of opportunity, many people thought that if we essentially opened the doors to able people, that if we certainly stratified and had a meritocratic society, that we could essentially promote inequality, promote a reduction in inequality and create opportunity in a lifetime. But what we've come to understand, and this is an important finding, is that the focus at IQ, which dominated the thinking in medical and, and, and biological circles, and certainly in educational circles, and in much policy circles, even dominates thinking today, that the focus on IQ and achievement tests, PISA scores, is a very limited focus and doesn't capture the full range of skills that matter in success in life. So there's a large body of evidence that shows that both cognitive and non-cognitive skills, skills that have to do with how much one controls one's life, how motivated people are, how well they adjust with others, and how resilient they are to failure and to challenges that they face, that those skills, along with cognitive skills, play a very important role in shaping life outcomes. And they actually affect uh, the ability of individuals to succeed. So one thing I'm saying, and there's a report that's going to be issued by the OECD in the next few weeks, actually, that says that they should go beyond PISA, which is kind of an amazing statement for OECD, given its focus on developing PISA. I participated in a conference in Brazil last March in which the uh, OECD uh, promoted the structure of these non-cognitive skills and showed how important they are. And this report, which will be issued shortly, will document that. So we need to think more than just of test scores. Secondly, and this is also an important point which we didn't fully understand, is that there are gaps in these skills. And these gaps appear relatively early in life for both cognitive and non-cognitive skills. And what's interesting and this is certainly true and it's very surprising in terms of research on schools and their impact for reducing inequality, is that during the schooling years, schools don't do much. During the, after the years when children enter formal schooling, say after age five and six, that uh, schools don't do that much in terms of widening or narrowing gaps in ability between children. And so there are many measures show near parallelism, and I'll show you some figures uh, along that in, in, in showing. So it's suggesting that these gaps in skills across people are there very early on. But of course, there's a question as to whether or not those gaps are due to genetics, or whether or not they're due to environments, or whether they're due to schooling. OK, so how do we actually go forward? What I want to argue today is that capabilities, these skills that allow people to flourish in life, these might be thought of as simply the manifestation of genetics. A hundred years ago, the eugenics movement in the United States and Europe, especially strong in England, was thinking that people were born smart, and that certain groups of people were smart, and that dumb people would perpetuate poverty, smart people would perpetuate uh, intelligence, and that very little we could do to change this IQ 
that was genetically determined. Well, we have a lot of evidence of experiments and other sources of evidence that are showing that there's a powerful role of parenting and environments. Genes are important. Genetic explanations are important. But we also know that they're not the whole story. And I would say that in terms of measures of family status and their contribution to this inequality, this intergenerational elasticity, that this uh, is a very small component of the story. And in fact, we know that genes, the effect of genes as they're measured in studies of heritability, are substantially diminished when we look at families that are growing up with their children in poverty, and children then uh, that don't have the kind of advantages that middle class children have. So I think that what we need is to understand that the genetics plays a very, very important role, but it's modified strongly by the environment. So capabilities can be created by investment. But what we've also come to understand, and this is the intersection of biology and economics, is that there's very compelling evidence for critical and sensitive periods in the development of children, and that different capacities are malleable at different stages of the life cycle. So we found, for example, that IQ, just in terms of raw problem-solving ability, becomes fairly stable. We can learn more. We can learn more facts. We can acquire skills. But in terms of problem-solving ability, those skills become fairly stable by the pre-adolescent years and the, before the teenage years really begin. There's some variability. IQ can decline due to physical health. There can be limitations. But what we've understood is that there are substantial, uh, substantial uh, malleabilities, much more in non-cognitive skills in the later years, in the adolescent years, even into young adulthood. So there's a lot of evidence that suggests that early life experiences shape both cognitive and non-cognitive skills, but those early life experiences are especially strong in IQ, and that there's more flexibility and malleability in the non-cognitive skills. And that's associated with work in neuroscience that suggests that the prefrontal cortex is developing skills even into the later uh, teenage and early adolescent, early young adult years. Now what we've understood is that family environments play a very important role. And we've come to understand that more than just in an intuitive way. We've come to understand how deeply the advantage and disadvantage of children is affected by the, the kind of environments they experience as young children. So we find that children from professional families are exposed to many more words, 50% more words than children from working class families. And that the disadvantaged children have very substantially compromised environments in ways that I'll try to document today. But what we've also learned is that early life conditions, however important they are, and they're very important, are not the whole story. So there is resilience, and especially resilience, not full recovery always from initial disadvantage, but partial recovery, and that we can, especially through the formation of personality, social, emotional, and character skills, provide and providing information to children, compromise and, and compensate, I should say, for early disadvantage. So the world is much more than a rigidly deterministic place. It's not all over at age three. It's not all over at age five. It's not all over at age 50, for that matter, or age 70. There's plenty of flexibility, resilience, and malleability. But what we also have found, that early life conditions play a very important role. What we've also learned, too, though, that if we have to compensate at later ages, that what is most effective are policies that essentially target children and that provide surrogate parenting. Parenting plays a very important role in a way that we're just beginning to understand as economists, as psychologists, and as neuroscientists. And we're coming together to understand how it is that the very process of mentoring, encouraging, tracking the child, what's sometimes called scaffolding in the child development literature, plays a very important role. And parent-child interactions, what are called sometimes uh, mentoring, these interactions play a fundamental role. We know that we're social beings. We know that so social sociality plays a very important role. But what we've come to understand is that even the conception of what the child is, how the child emerges, is something that is truly a dynamic system that involves 
interaction between the parent and the child, the teacher, the mentor, and as the child ages, a much richer set of actors are influencing the child and the sense of identity and self and agency that play such an important role in creating how we act, how we respond to conditions in life. And so what we've understood then as a result of all of this work is that there are generally uh, uh, high returns to disadvantaged, to investing in disadvantaged children. And that there's a phenomenon called dynamic complementarity that I want to talk about today, where skill begets skill, that early advantage plays a very powerful role in promoting uh, the advantage. So we can compensate, especially when the children are young and malleable and flexible. And that suggests a refocus of public policy. It's not just that early childhood is a period where children should be put in child care centers without substantial investment. But in fact, it's a period of greatest opportunity for promoting skills and reducing inequality. So let me just show you some figures. And this is figures taken from the US and also figures from Japan. So for example, if you go across families in the United States, this is a study that became uh, very important in understanding how much children, children from families that are on welfare, more disadvantaged families versus professional families, so if you just looked at the number of words that children heard in a typical hour, the children of disadvantaged parents were hearing about 600 words per hour. The children of professional children, uh, families, were actually hearing three to four times more number of words. And so, and actually the style of parenting changed from prohibitions, uh, many more prohibitions than encouraging words, to many more affirmatives and few prohibitions for children from more advantaged families. And this led to substantial differences in terms of uh, vocabulary that children had uh, even at age three. So a very early age, children start huge gaps, twice as many words for children from professional families. And we see something comparable here in Japan. So for example, a study done in 2010 showed essentially how important it was uh, uh, that the mothers had a much more, much more active perception of their children's well-being and the importance of uh, educational awareness and, and how many books the, the, the mother would read. Oops, uh, I made a mistake there. Uh, so, for example, visits to museums, reading books, uh, aware that the child should be exposed to foreign cultures, books at home and many other measures of parental, of parenting, that more educated mothers. And this is a gap that I'm going to return to repeatedly, and a gap that's documented in Japan and so forth. Now, in the United States, we have the following data, and there's a counterpart for this in Japan. So for example, if you look, for example, at achievement scores, just the kind of PISA scores or achievement test scores that only become reliable at around age three, that you see enormous gaps. This is the test scores of children at age uh, 18 between highly educated mothers and mothers who are not even secondary school graduates. And we can see a substantial gap. But the amazing thing is, is that much of that gap is there at age three. So the, the gap that's important for life uh, chances and for success in life, those are there. And the other part that's they're very early and schools and these are data from the US where schools are quite unequal, schools make a very small difference in widening or narrowing the gaps in those test scores. And we see something comparable in Japan. And here I don't have a direct measure of parental education, but if you look at something like annual household income, you can see substantial differences uh, that are emerging, three-year-olds, four-year-olds, and five-year-olds. As you can see, the children of more advantaged families, you're seeing that the Vocabularies are much more substantial, and you're seeing this growth that's occurring that's nearly parallel. And there's something, and there's work that's going on now in Japan that's actually going to build our skill base and, and this understanding. So you can see, for example, how the father's education has an effect on understanding. Uh, so you go from less educated to more educated families. Uh, you see substantial differences in terms of understanding of mathematics, knowledge of Japanese, and uh, logic. And you can see that 
family income has a similar pattern. And uh, we can see that uh, mother's education is playing also a substantial role. And uh, in terms of knowledge of mathematics and, uh, and other, uh, in terms of family ability. So we can see substantial differences that occur. And this is an active area of research that's converging from many countries around the world. So family income plays a very important role. But the, the important question is, what do we make of this? Is it family income per se? Family income is a stand-in for many different things. What do families do? Families pass on their genes. They also pass on environments. They also have different parenting practices in terms of encouraging children and promoting the well-being. Or is it schools that children are going to? And this is an open area, an active area of research in economics and social science. What do we know? If we look, for example, at the United States, we see very dramatic trends. Very dramatic trends that actually are showing, for example, that uh, 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 if we go back to the period around 1976 or so, uh, we can see the percentage of children in single parent homes. And in the United States, this is a very large statistic. It's 30% of all children are living in single parent homes by 2012, two years ago. And the biggest growth is in parents that were never married. And so these conditions, I want to argue, are families where children are actually substantially impaired and the resources are much less available in terms of parenting, in terms of resources available to the child. Now the conditions in Japan aren't so serious. So we can see, for example, the whole scale of activity in Japan is much lower. But there's still this trend. It's much smaller, but there is a growing trend in Japan so I don't want to say that problems in Japan are at all of the scale that face the United States and in many Western European countries, but nonetheless, there is a trend that's moving in that direction. And we can see that the percentage of single parent families is actually, oops, uh, is actually growing. And again, this is a condition associated with disadvantage. In many ways, fewer parental resources, less parental income, and if we remember the charts, those mothers with single parent families, uh, heads of single parent families were some among the lowest wage workers in the country. So that provides a very important uh, challenge uh, for Japanese society. So let me lay out a framework that's been developed that essentially can take us through and understand how to interpret these figures and how we can think about what wise public policy would be. And I want to talk about the concept of capabilities. And this is a very important concept. I want to talk about capabilities, how capabilities are formed, and how we can essentially think about these ways to shape capabilities. So here I want to use some economic models, some simple economic models. But what do I mean by capabilities? Capabilities are a concept that's used a little more inclusively than I'm using them today. But I'll take the idea from Amartya Sen and uh, his co-author Martha Nussbaum. And they define these capabilities as the freedoms people have to achieve and to act. And you can think of these as potentials that people have. It's not a particular shaping of people in a particular way. It's a capacity. It's an empowering of people to be able to function in different ways. So more intelligent people can do more things. People who can control their emotions and basically act in certain ways gain greater credibility and greater strength in society and gain greater capacities to function and deal with others. So I'm defining these capabilities as being a very important ingredients for successful lives. But as I said earlier, they're multiple in nature, these capabilities. It's more than just IQ. These include the social skills. And then we can think about these vectors of capabilities as shaping the capacities of people to act. They affect the ability of people to earn income, the ability of them to acquire knowledge about the world, to understand different people and different situations, understanding how to be a better parent and how to shape their own child's lives and help them, and how they have a capacity to restrain themselves, to plan ahead, and so forth. And these capabilities are traits that many people think, some of the social psychologists, I don't know if there are any social psychologists here in the room today, but there have been some views in the past that these are very ephemeral, that these capabilities vary across situations. 
they're stable across situation, these capabilities. That we have these stable traits, but they evolve over time. And so we're not just figments of creations in particular situations. There are stable traits, they're very important, but they do evolve over time and with age. And so we can think about these relationships that essentially map uh, these capabilities to outcomes, yt. So this is just an abstract notation showing how low dimensional capabilities, things associated with cognition, time preference, the ability, persist, and so forth, all of these capabilities essentially shape the outcomes that give us, that allow us to act in these ways. So, and the, the second ingredient of this is how these capabilities evolve. And so here I use a very simple schematic to essentially say these capabilities in the next age depend on the capabilities at a given age, the amount of investment in the child, and then the parental environment, broadly defined. And this technology of skill formation has many interesting properties. And some of the most interesting properties are that the skills are self-productive, so that skill begets skill, that it turns out that the higher level of investments promote skill, but the higher level of the skill helps promote the productivity of those investments. And the same thing is true about parental environments. So a key concept here is complementarity, synergism, that you go across these skills, these skills cross-fertilize each other. But the capacity to invest the productivity of this investment is age dependent, stage dependent in the life cycle. And for certain skills, this is a vector, so for certain skills, the investments are very productive at, very, at some ages, and that gives rise to the concept of critical and sensitive periods. And that's a very important concept. So this complementarity increases with age. So it happens then that as you get older, that the ability of people to learn, the ability of people to benefit from investment actually is increasing with the level of skill that the individual has. Now that by itself sounds like a very pessimistic view. If you have it, it's easier to acquire more of it. So if you know how to, if you're smart, you can get even smarter. You can actually gain some, in, some, some skills and it becomes easier. So that's a form of complementarity that's very disequalizing. And that's the kind of view by itself that actually promoted some of the early work in eugenics, thinking, well, able people are the ones who benefit the most. We really want a world of the meritocratic. We want to keep the most able. But what that view ignored was the importance of investment over the life cycle and how skills actually were formed at different stages and to do with different degrees of effectiveness. And so what we've come to understand is that this complementarity is actually stronger at later stages of the life cycle. But early on, it suggests that there may even be compensation that's possible. That in the early years, it's possible that complementarity uh, changes. And what you're getting is that the greatest productivity for investments come from a most disadvantage. And why is that? because the investing in the disadvantage builds the skill base for later investments in productivity. And so in that sense, we have what's called dynamic complementarity. So I've given you the idea of static complementarity. And so the idea of dynamic complementarity with self-productivity is as we raise investment today, especially among the disadvantaged, we create the skill base that gives them the complementarity that more advantaged children would have by nature of their birth into more advantaged environments. And so this dynamic complementarity plays a very important role in everything I have to say today. OK, well, other things matter as well. Family preferences for child outcomes play a very important role. Family preferences we know vary. And family knowledge varies. There's a tremendous variability, especially among disadvantaged families, about what are good uh, practices and what are good child-rearing practices. Some cultures and some subgroups within cultures deny that they should be interacting actively with the children, have a very negative style of parenting. Others, much more encouraging. And these also shape child outcomes. And uh, then something that economists have spent a lot of time on, and the great Gatsby curve, the Gatsby curve is built around, is that family resources, broadly defined, play a very important role. 
So if, in fact, a fa child is restricted, as they are in many societies, by the income of the parents, say in the ability to pay tuition, the ability to transfer and pay for a private schooling, and we know that there are some huge differences in private schooling uh, among children here in Japan and also around the world, that this access to money can play a huge difference. And so there's also a notion there could be restrictions on transfers across generations, restrictions on transfers within generations, and transfers uh, of public provision of investment, and information and genes. So the question is, why do we put all this together? Well, this is a diagram that suggests the dynamics of the life cycle. So it's a very busy diagram, but it just offers schematically. If we think about the life cycle of a child, we think about it as stages. Just like in a plant that's growing, any organism that's growing, we've come to understand much more the various aspects of the stages here in the life cycle. So early on in the life cycle, in the prenatal years, we see that early investments play a very important role. So prenatal, whether the mother smokes, drinks, these are factors that have a powerful role in shaping the ability of the child. We know that in studies that if the child is exposed to chemicals or environments that are very toxic, that can lead to substantial impairments. But also drugs and alcohol and tobacco and by the mother in early childhood. And then we go through the stages of childhood. There's a synergistic dynamic process. And as the knowledge is acquiring, we gain more and more understanding about how uh, humans develop and how they flourish. And so there's a challenge here. The empirical and theoretical challenge is to understand how these links are emerging. And we've come to understand quite a bit about these links, much more than we did even 20 years ago or even 10 years ago. So let me try to explain uh, how these links are formed and what we know about those links. So we can talk about uh, very, I won't go through very much formal models, but we can imagine models where people are living uh, for multiple periods as children, their parents, and then their grandparents. So we have multiple generations. They're living at the same time, but they're playing very different roles. And the early versions of these models were thinking about children as passive recipients of investment who make no economic decisions and whose consumption is ignored. And so we can talk about these models, and I'll just really sketch a very simple notion. We can start with these capabilities, and we think about the human capital of the child in the next generation. So this is a formal equation, which I probably shouldn't even put up. Professor Akabayashi suggested I should, so I'll blame him for this. <laughs> I'll also draw on some of his work, as you'll see in a minute. But it's basically just a formal, it's a mathematical statement of uh, the technology that I mentioned a minute ago. So what it's saying is this is basically just a particular functional form that says, OK, how the investment today uh, and the stock of skills today and the parental environment interact. But the crucial thing is how these different parameters uh, are, what the strength of these parameters are, and how investments, this gamma is a measure of the productivity of investment, how much that changes over the life cycle of the child and what we know about that. So a key idea is the skills accumulating. So early, so this captures in a very simple schematic how early investments are uh, investing in, in uh, a life cycle and how the early investments accumulate. They do it in two ways. They give you a direct amount of skill, but they also then allow the child to build a skill base that make future investments more productive. So I won't go much into the details of this, but it leads to a very interesting case. And there's something that uh, a technology that uh, was actually developed uh, independently by Vasily Leontiev in the US and a famous Japanese economist, Sono, uh, here in uh, Japan in the 1940s. Uh, and that is the so-called Leontiev case. And it's interesting to think about two cases. One is a case where early investments are critical. So it's like sometimes called the left shoe and right shoe technology. That if you don't invest early, it's going to be very difficult to invest to make any investment late. So in the limit, if you have very low level of investment, any investment beyond that level is not going to be productive. So what that means is a child born into disadvantage 
is not going to be able to be compensated and raised back to advantage. That's a very pessimistic view. The opposite is a, is a model of perfect substitution, where basically it doesn't matter when the child receives the investment, that the child can, we can compensate early versus late. And much social policy has actually adopted that view as a point of view. So anyway, without getting into details, I will say that the models that have dominated uh, much of the thinking have been those of perfect substitution. And what we see, so I'm not going to, I think I'll skip these because uh, this is, I'm running a little low on time, but I can state this verbally, that what we have then is that individuals will be credit constrained, uh, I'm going to go through all of this, and talk about what the implications would be. So if a child is born into disadvantage, and this multiplier plays a very big role, and credit markets are imperfect, then those families that don't have very many resources, even if they wanted to invest in their children, don't have those resources. And if the technology is such that early investments are very determinative of later investments, that you need that initial skill base to get any productivity in later years, that that is going to be a, uh, a very uh, uh, great bind. Now, what do we know about that technology? Well, we know something about the technology, and that is that it's closer to this Leontief technology. It's closer to the left and right technology than we'd like to admit. The early years are really quite important. It's not quite as drastic as the notion that whatever you had as a young child, you can't do any better, and you have to get the minimum investment and won't be any more productive in the later years. We can remediate, but it's a much richer story. And we remediate typically across different dimensions. And that's where the multiple skills story plays a very important role. But many people, looking at the Gatsby curve, have actually looked at this notion about how family income plays a very important role. So for example, uh, if you look at this graph here that comes from the US data, what we see is that college attendance has a very strong basis in terms of family income. So the first graph here. This is data from the 1970s, uh, early 1980s. Children born in the late 70s or in the early 80s and then followed over their lifetimes. And what we can see is that able children, the very able children, are much more likely to go to college than children who are less able, and we go down the ability distribution. But within each level of ability, we also see that kids who are less able, or sorry, have lower family income, so we go across quartiles of family income, the children from lower family income levels are also the ones who are less likely to go to college. So family income plays a role. And that kind of thinking is dominated thinking, that we should really supplement family income. And if you look at the United States data in 1997, we see a similar pattern. And what's interesting, and I'll put these two graphs together, is that what we see is that there's been a growth in who goes to college especially among the less able children in the United States, uh, it's very interesting. There isn't that much growth because there wasn't that much room to grow among the most able children. What we also see, though, has been dramatic growth among the less able children, especially those who are rich. So that suggests that family income plays a very important role. And that has suggested income policies of transferring money from the rich to the poor. That is typically the strategy that many countries adopt and that many economists adopt. It's a version of alms to the poor. It's an object of redistribution. What I want to argue today is that's a very limited view. Money is a stand-in, as I tried to say earlier, for many different things. So what we see then is that this evidence doesn't tell us anything about credit constraints. You can do something similar in Japan. And you can say, oh, look, here we see that the percentage of high school graduates who go on to college and we can see, in terms of parental income, that there is a uh, <coughs> very strong gradient. As you move from very relatively lower income families to higher income families, family income is playing a big role. So should we redistribute income? Should Japanese society have more redistributive policies? Not necessarily. And I'll give you some very striking evidence that takes us out of the world of the US and Japan and actually compares the US to Denmark. Denmark is frequently viewed as a society that is the most equal, one of the most equal among all the Western welfare states. And in some recent work that I've done in looking at the Danish welfare state, 
I will give you the kind of comparison that we can see in terms of who graduates high school and who graduates college. So we can see that even in very equal Denmark, Denmark there's no tuition, free tuition, very strong redistribution. The Gini coefficients are very low. And yet what we see, it's quite interesting in terms of college attendance, this is comparing Denmark with the US, yeah, that there is some, uh, uh, you know, mother's education plays a very strong role. But what we also see is that college educated mother children are much more likely. But look at how steep the difference is, even in Denmark. Family education is playing a very important role. And remember, Denmark also has universal preschool. It has many of these other social programs. And that's also true even in completing secondary school. And so what's striking about this comparison, and this is a very busy graph, but it's nonetheless interesting, it suggests, take a look at cognitive skills. Now, I don't know if you can actually see these uh, figures. I can barely see them myself. Uh, what, what it is is basically showing parental income and basically parental measures of education. And so what we can see is that the pattern that children from disadvantaged families having lower levels of ability, that's a pattern that's actually quite similar between the United States and Denmark, this very equal society. So that causes us to maybe rethink about the Gatsby curve, this relationship about income inequality and social mobility. What are the real determinants of this? If we look at high school completion in terms of ability, these are the capabilities that I talked about, we see a very sharp similarity between Denmark and the, and, and the US. So that's very interesting. Once these capabilities are formed, however they're formed, they play a very powerful role. And I think that's a very important and intriguing finding. And again, we can look at the gradients, uh, and we can see that once we condition on things like family uh, uh, capabilities, that income and wealth gradients virtually disappear. So there's a lot of role. I won't go through all of the academic work on this, but I'll just summarize it briefly. But when we look at the evidence on credit constraints, what we find is that redistributive policies per se, transferring income, even though that's been the concern of many economists, many leading economists, Nobel Prizes have been given for people designing efficient schemes for transferring income, and papers are written today. Even this very moment, people are writing papers about the importance of family income. What we've come to understand is that pure income transfer policies are not likely to be effective. And what existing studies show is that income transfer policies themselves have very weak effects. And this contrast between Denmark and the United States, I think, is particularly dramatic and, and in support of this area. So I'm not going to go through all of the work that's being done. There's a lot of very creative work. I will simply say that what we've come to understand as the academic literature has evolved is we've come to understand and introduce multiple capabilities We've come to understand the importance of both cognitive and non-cognitive skills and the importance of different stages of the life cycle and the need to prioritize investments for those skills that are most effectively targeted at certain ages. So I won't go through all of this, talk about multiple children uh, and, and so forth and so on, but what I will say is what we've come to understand as a result of computing and estimating these models. So there's a lot of econometrics, there's a lot of good social science, and my understanding, talking to Professor Akabayashi and looking at his work and that of his colleagues, is we're gaining here in Japan evidence that essentially will allow us to make even more tight comparisons between the US and Japan. But where the comparisons have been made, when they've been made, a lot of similarity seems to exist. What we've come to understand, though, is what is socially fair in terms of redistributing investments, providing parental resources, providing children with those essential early environments of investment, that is also economically efficient. The rate of return on these early childhood investments that target disadvantaged children, that exploit this dynamic complementarity, that is a very important, has a very high rate of return that rivals that of the stock market in the US before the 2008 meltdown. So there's been tremendous results. And so without getting into all the details, that what we find is that early investments go a long way towards building the skill investments. So the life cycle of a child is not just kind of one uniform lump. 
The early years play a very important role, and it gets harder and harder to learn and to remediate the later we go into the life cycle, and I think that's very important. Um, so there's a lot of work about testing and operationalizing the theory. I'll just give you a small flavor of this. So we think about these capabilities, and we actually now can measure these. So there's a very active study, and it's summarized in part by the new OECD uh, volume that's talking about measuring capabilities. Uh, and this is where psychologists and economists have come together. And economists have helped, I think, enrich the level of understanding in psychology. Psychologists have enriched, enriched the understanding of economics. And so we have these vectors of capabilities that emerge over the life cycle. And we think about, we know now, better ways to measure all of these traits risk aversion, neuroticism, uh, self-discipline, and the like. Uh, and they, they determine functionings. And so what we understand is, and this is what I was putting up schematically early on, that these outcomes depend on levels of effort that people have, environments that people are in, and the level of capabilities they have. This poses a huge challenge conceptually to both economics and psychology. This suggests that even the tests that we use to measure the performance of school systems, the performance of countries, the performance of students, consists of a bundle of traits. It consists not only of the test that we think we measure, the thing that IQ tests measure, or an achievement test measure, or PISA tests measure, but also the effort that a child expels and what the, what the incentives are for the child to perform on the test. That's not fully appreciated, and it turns out to be very important. I'll just give you one example. In studies in the US, there have been substantial differences documented in terms of the IQ between blacks and whites. IQ differences have been as large as one standard deviation. Many people before thought that was genetically determined. It turns out that if we incentivize children from disadvantaged environments to actually perform on these tests, that they raise their effort. And their effort is substantially enhanced so incentivization, in this case, consists of giving them a candy for each correct answer on an IQ test. That, by itself, can eliminate the black-white gap. And it turns out that children who are more conscientious and more motivated are the ones who actually are less likely to be incentivized. They're already working at full time. So these capabilities affect their performance on these tasks. And so I don't want to go into this in great detail, but it turns out that an IQ test or uh, building a ditch or building a, uh, creating a novel or doing any of these activities involves a lot of things involving both these capabilities, these thetas, the effort that people have, and the environments in which they're placed. And we really should have to, we have to standardize that to understand what intelligence, what all of these traits measure, but understand that all of the psychological measures are just measures of performance on a given task. But we can and, and we rely critically on these measures in evaluating social policy, I think what we need to do is actually think about standardizing those measures and really thinking about understanding them. I'll just give you an example. I'm not going to uh, go through this, but this is an example of the kind of research that we've done. And we can find, for example, that just the simple decision of who graduates uh, some secondary school. These capabilities which emerge over the lifetime, these capabilities play a very powerful role. So if somebody is very high up in the cognitive distribution, very high up in the non-cognitive distribution, they're almost certain to graduate from secondary school. Those children who are very low in those attributes have a very high risk of dropping out. So those capabilities play a very important role. As I say repeatedly, those capabilities can be shaped. So this same dimension, this same vector of capabilities predicts a wide variety of outcomes for things having to do with crime, wages, health, ties. So I, can, I could give you hundreds of pictures uh, that actually show that this same low dimensional vector of capabilities is very strongly predictive. Incentives matter, no question about it. But also, these traits matter as well. But these traits aren't fixed by genes alone. They're fixed by investments in children. So we've estimated these technologies and we've come to understand that these capabilities evolve over the life cycle. And so if we now study, and I don't know if there's a counterpart yet in Japan, I hope there is soon, that if we look at the outcome in terms of uh, educational attainment, 
that these measures that we have of parental investments, which are by themselves incomplete, explain about a third of all the variants of educational attainment. And that this notion of self-productivity becomes stronger. Another way to say that is it becomes harder and harder to remediate the later we get in the stage of the life cycle. And so this kind of dynamic complementarity plays a huge role in making it difficult for individuals to uh, achieve uh, success later on in life. So there's an emerging dynamic complementarity. So what does this say about policy? So we want targeted policies. We want to think about uh, what the way a social planner might want to devise a scheme. And we might want to think more broadly about what investment strategy should be. And so what we, if we're only interested, and this is the case where a purely economic analysis gets very close to an analysis that is also one that might be arrived at through completely different considerations of social fairness and equity. That what is socially fair in this context in terms of parental investment in children and substitutes for parental investment when it's lacking turns out to be socially uh, fair and economically efficient. It has very high economic rate of return. So here is where you get something that's very rare in economic policy, very little equity efficiency trade-off, very little conflict between redistribution and efficiency. And it's an avenue of public policy that needs to be explored more. So I won't go through all these graphs. But what I would, uh, what I would do is, what do we know about the intervention literature? So I've given you some uh, studies. I've been involved in, and my wife here has been involved as well and is actively involved in planning and designing studies of interventions, where we go in both with running experiments and looking at non-experimental data on how uh, we can target disadvantaged children. In the United States, we had a group of very disadvantaged children in a small city outside of Detroit called Ypsilanti, Michigan. Uh, it was a Ford Motor Company plant. Uh, it made a very, uh, uh, it was a very important uh, plant uh, for Ford Motor Company. It's closed recently, but uh, it's uh, quite, uh, quite a famous uh, site. Uh, and what the study did is it took disadvantaged children who were three to four years of age. They were all African American. And they were all at risk. And their IQ was restricted to be low. So these IQs were actually average 80 IQ, or 100 is a standard normal uh, IQ. Uh, so what we found, and this was interesting, and this is showing how the field has changed and how our thinking and our understanding about how to target and how to measure the success of interventions has changed, that what we've come to understand is that the initial studies focused on raising the IQ of these children. And so what happened, if you look at these kids, these kids are now about 50 years of age. We're, we're following them. So some kids were randomly assigned to treatment, some randomly assigned to control. The treatment group children had this huge surge in IQ. So by age seven, uh, six, they had very high levels of IQ. That's this treatment group. But by age 10, the difference between the treatment and the control group, which is the solid line group, basically vanished. So many people looking at this under the influence of cognitive psychology in the 1960s said, see, this was a failure. And in fact, it was studies like this that led to Arthur Jensen writing a very famous paper in the United States saying that we could not remedy disadvantage, that this IQ deficit was real, it was probably genetically determined, and the best thing that we could do is basically put these people into uh, remedial education and understand they were kind of born dumb and should stay dumb. That was a view, and it created a huge rage. What we've come to understand is that precisely because people were looking only at IQ and not looking at the other dimensions of human achievement, that they led to, this, to a misinterpretation of these data. So then we looked at, and this is some result, we visited the center, we actually collected data that hadn't been examined before, and what we found was that personal behavior Character, the ability of children to control themselves and interact with others. If you just look at a bar chart for the treatment group and the control group, you'll see the treatment group has a much higher score. What that means is that they are much able to control themselves, to work with others, to function, to, to function in a, in a very active uh, a way. And so what happened then was that this, there were substantial differences 
And uh, we see that true in terms of uh, social and emotional skills. So a number of psychological measures, as measured by school teachers, who are fairly reliable guides. So these are measured early on in the life of the children in the public schools, after the treatment was finished. The treatment was only two years. Kids were put back in the same schools, were put back in the same environments, and then have been followed ever since. What we found was substantial treatment effects for these people. And you can see these dimensions. So for example, we can see, and this is something that boggles the imagination of some people. So it turned out that when we look even at achievement test scores, remember IQ is no higher. The achievement test scores are higher for the kids who are in the treatment group than the control group. Why? Because they were more motivated, they learned more. So even though they're no smarter, I just showed you their IQs on average are the same, they're more motivated and they actually acquire more knowledge. They're much less likely to commit crime. They're much less likely to participate and uh, use heroin and in uh, a number of measures of, uh, of, uh, of, of social participation. And when we measure their effects on health, we find they're much less likely to smoke, they're much less likely to have unhealthy diets. And when we look at a similar study uh, done in, uh, 10 years later in North Carolina, where we actually get much more detailed measure of health, we actually find that precisely because of this improvement in self-control, precisely because of this gain, we see substantial differences between the treatment group in terms of things like blood pressure. So systolic blood pressure is a measure of risk of cardiovascular disease. These people are 35 years of age. And so here we can see the control group has a as above threshold level, putting these, them at risk for cardiovascular disease, even at age 35, the, control, the treatment group much lower. Same thing is true of diastolic, and look at measures of what are called metabolic syndrome, things at risk for heart disease, for diabetes, measures of obesity. What we see is substantial improvements between the treatment and control group. And when we put these things together, what we understand is that we have improved these cognitive and non, these, these non-cognitive skills, these social and emotional regulatory skills, and we therefore have improved their capacities to function in life. And as from these data, we actually can compute that the rates of return are seven to eight percent per annum. So think about what that means. For each dollar invested, there's going to be, or each yen invested, there's gonna be one more yen, 1.07 yen the next year. And that accrues over the whole lifetime. That's a very substantial investment. So what do we come to understand about this? I've kind of given you a very abstract model of investment. But what we've come to understand is that it's the nature of the relationship between the parent and the child, which is something psychologists have said for many years. Uh, but uh, we only recently started incorporating this into public policy that a main channel of influence is in terms of parent-child interactions, enhanced attachment and engagement of the parents. So it's not just that we somehow lecture to the child, it's how we engage the child, how we get the child to interact, and how it is we can stimulate that relationship between parent and child. So how it is that some of these interventions work, they work not only by intervening with the child, but by intervening with the parents, by giving them knowledge that they lack, by teaching them how methods work to create interactions between themselves and their children, uh, and to foster some relationship that lasts over the lifetime of the child. So what are the mechanisms? Changing information, changing preferences, and changing participation. So I'll just say that there are substantial differences. When we look at the increase in parental warmth, we look at the family conflict is diminished, and the parental authority is basically increased. So we've learned a lot about how to scaffold the child. So I don't, I'm running out of time, uh, so I need to sort of summarize this, but let me just talk very briefly about a policy of promoting education. What does education in the post-early years do? It's promoting education a foolish policy. I showed you that the gaps between the advantage and disadvantage are not there. No, it's not true. Education has a huge gain, especially for those who have those skills to benefit from it. One of the leading components of people not going to education, not graduating from school, not participating is precisely lacking that early skill base. So understanding the dynamics of this, how we promote the early skill base, 
that education can play a very important role. And so we can find, for example, and this is a study done on English data with Gabriella Conti uh, some four years ago, what we see is that many effects of education that we see reported. So the example, education has strong effect on hourly wages for both men and women, strong effects on employment, strong effects on exercise, reduction in obesity, reduction in depression, reduction in smoking. But what we can actually see, and we've broken it up, and I don't have time to go into the great uh, detail of this, but what we can see is that a big chunk of the effect of education that we just measure, the more educated people, and this is people just to finish secondary school, that what we see is that the more educated people gain substantially, and a big part of that is a causal effect. And we can see the effect of the early family environment factors. That's the area in blue contributing. And those are the factors of ability that play a very important role. So uh, we can also see that education does promote uh, knowledge. We hope it does. <laughs> uh, but we also it promotes ability to self-regulate. So let me summarize. Let me summarize uh, the main points of this lecture. What I've tried to understand in understanding a much broader conception of human development, what it means to be a complete human being, what it means to flourish, and that we've come to understand that multiple skills shape child and adult achievement. We've come to understand much more than we did in the past, that multiple capabilities matter for success in life, and that these capabilities are stable across situations. They are things that can be shaped. They're not all genetically determined. But different skills have different critical and sensitive periods. We have a much deeper understanding of when in the life cycle to, to develop. So to promote cognition, we know that it's very important to intervene in the very early years, remote IQ. Children in very severely disadvantaged environments, like out in Western China, where there may be deficiencies in iron and zinc and basic materials, basic uh, nutrients, that what we actually can see is impairments in IQ that can come just from lack of micronutrients, but also from lack of stimulation. What we've also come to understand, and Professor Akabayashi has played a very important role in helping to shape our understanding of this, is that parenting, attachment, and parent-child interactions play a very important role. And so we've come to understand, instead of just thinking of the child as being somebody lectured to, here's the child, we're imposing knowledge on the child, that the process of education is this one of interaction, of synergy. And so using the language of dynamical systems, we think of the child as an essentially an emergent system. And it's an emergent system developing an identity, developing autonomy. And policies operate through multiple channels. And so we want to know when and where these policies have effects. And we know that there's a strong relationship between family income and child outcomes. And yet, as I tried to illustrate, in this study from Denmark, comparing Denmark and the US. I think a study between Denmark and Japan would be a great study if we could do it. What we could see is that the mechanisms of family income, family income stands for many different things. And that redistribution, per se, is not going to be the answer for promoting child development. It's going to be access to these resources of parenting and stimulation, which the modern developments, modern knowledge, has actually shown to be so important. And so we come to understand that, uh, that understanding, uh, to understand inequality and social mobility, that we want to think not just of the standard approach which has been taken for addressing poverty of, of redistribution of resources. There's a notion that somehow that money should be given just from the rich to the poor and that that redistributional policy plays an important role. I know there's an ongoing debate in Japan. And I don't want to say that there shouldn't be redistribution. But I think we want to also think about what I call pre-distribution. Changing the skill base, changing that set of capabilities is going to be the wise strategy. And so I think that's the point that we can see this, this emergence of how economics, econometrics can merge with neuroscience, with psychology, and many other fields to think about how. So then to answer the question I started at the beginning, should there be policies that attempt to lower the IGE? this relationship, this beta that I put up? And what form should those interventions take? And the answers are basically, we know that accident of birth is very powerful. And you can say, and here's I draw in the language of economics, that uh, 
yeah, there's a market failure. People can't choose their parents. You can't buy your parents. I mean, in principle, if you had a perfect market, very famous paper by, uh, written in about 15 years ago by Shashadri and uh, Ayagari and Greenwood, basically showed, yes, if you had a market where a fetus could imagine buying a good parent or a bad parent, or even a proto-fetus that they could somehow insure fully, that's just not available. So there is a kind of market failure. But what we've come to understand is it's this early family environment. It's not so much money as parenting that matters. We see children from very poor environments succeeding when you see the parental resources being provided. So parenting can be very high and very high quality. And we've seen that in the sense that disadvantaged people, uh, migrants coming to the US, people coming from very disadvantaged backgrounds uh, are actually finding that they have very strong uh, roots uh, and finding that family encouragement plays a very important role. And so what we've come to understand is, and this is not such a nice story, that if we have low ability children, if we have children in the adolescent years who have very low level of ability and very low level of motivation, that college is not for them. It's not a high economic return, and it's not socially efficient. And so a lot of the policies that has been pursued about bringing disadvantaged children into, into college without thinking about looking at the skill base that they suffered or did not get prior to that time, those policies are less wise than, than many people would like to go ahead. So the evidence on the effectiveness of pure income transfers is rather weak, and the targeted transfers <coughs> that target skills, that build these capabilities, play a very important role. But we should recognize that the case for reducing the IGE is largely political or philosophical, namely the case about redistribution. What we want to understand is understanding much more the importance of family mechanisms and how we might go about understanding how enhancing policies by strengthening families by recognizing that some families don't have these parenting resources that other families have, that those policies are actually likely to be far more effective, and that a policy evaluation system and a policy that actually recognizes these multiple skills, these multiple dimensions of skills, and the multiple stages of creating skills will be one that's far more effective. So thank you very much for your attention. I would say that uh, Professor Fukuzawa, who's name, whose lecture, whose memory is being commemorated by this lecture, I think would probably agree with a fair amount of what I'm saying. I think he might be unhappy with the fact there is a partial genetic basis for these capabilities. But I think he would also recognize that there's tremendous opportunity in making an equalizing opportunity for providing education. But I would amend his early statements done in the 1860s and 1870s by saying, we want to think more broadly about education, that it's not just schools. It's also early family life and integrating family life and understanding it. So thank you very much for your attention and for inviting me here today.